Hello and welcome to the new studio of the Subs Bench podcast. As you may have seen in the last couple of weeks, we've teamed up with Football Queensland to bring back the video episodes that we started two or three years ago. Over the course of this season, we're going to have key personnel, players, coaches, administrators on the show as our guests to get their unique insight, viewpoint and opinion on the game. Our first guest today is the CEO of FQ, it's Rob Cavallucci. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it and tune in every second week, so that's every fortnight, for new episodes. Welcome, Welcome. to the Thank Subs Bench. You. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. G'day. Not a problem. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh, no, no worries at all. Like, beautiful you know, setting. A bit weird sitting at a table with people again. Yeah, yeah it is. That's <laughs> what we usually do, but it's but, nice. Uh, but yeah, it is nice. Mm. And uh, look, we we got quite a lot to get through with yourself, Rob. And, um, Sounds good. I oh. think the... The position that you're in, of course, the, the the head of you know football in the state, um, your position actually attracts a lot of uh, attention, uh, fairly negative attention at times. Does that does that sometimes um, become an issue for you, or is it just a case of look, I got a job to do, we'll get through? Um, yeah, well, it's a it's an interesting question to start on. It's, um, uh, to answer it quickly and then get into some more detail yeah. in the answers, does it bother me? Uh, no, it absolutely doesn't bother me at all. Um, uh, I think for a couple of really important reasons, um, uh, the governing body and my role within it, it's not a popularity contest at the end of the day. Um, there's uh, any CEO or any leader for that matter, whether you're a football coach or whether you're the president of a club, your role is to make the decisions that are in the interest of the team, the club, or in my case, the game. And um, that's what I do every day. And as a consequence of that, um, invariably, uh, people within the community uh, aren't always going to agree with that because they come to the conversation with a very different lens, uh, very different priorities. And um, my priorities are very, very clear. Our role here is to, is to govern the sport, administer the game within the regulatory framework, and we do that uh, without fear or favour, and um, uh, we absolutely don't make decisions um, for the purposes of being popular. Yeah, that doesn't enter the equation. Um, we make the decisions that are always in the interest of the game. So, uh, does it bother me? No, it shouldn't bother any leader um, because it's you know it's not a it's not a KPI of mine that I have to be popular, but it is a KPI that I do make the difficult decisions to take the game forward. Yeah. Do you think sometimes the negativity holds the progress back? Would that, would that be a fair question? Um, well, I guess it's an interesting perspective that, that I guess you asked that from. And, and in asking it in some ways, I think you actually highlight some of the issues with not only sport, but in, in our case, football. And that is, um, where do we get this feedback from? So where are you getting that? Um, negative sentiment from like where where are you collecting that anecdotal information like I'm just I'm asking that in terms of how do we break that information down we we go to the community the football community every year like last year we got I don't know, 14 fifteen thousand bits of survey information back which we incorporated in, into our decision making whereas if you ask a question about popularity it's you're getting it from social media or even worse subsections of social media do you let those subsections of social media drive the sport? And the answer is absolutely no. Like that's where do we get our information from? We can't let those interest groups uh, drive the direction of the game. So it's a, it's a it's a question back to you guys as well. It's um because having a debate about that yeah. is, is what do we look for for guidance to drive and support the decisions we need to make? Do we ask the broader community, 90% of them whom are silent and just focused on taking the game forward and worried about their club or worried about their team? Or do you listen to the mob? And I think that's something that you can often often go down a rabbit hole with yeah. and get lost in um, about whether you stay focused on the ambitions of the game or you get distracted very easily. So. Um, the team here are obviously very focused on um, taking the game forward and not being 
caught up in personal yep. attacks or um, personal opinions because they don't help anyone, they don't help the game. So if people come to us with constructive views and go, look, here's an issue with this part of the game and here's what I think we can do to solve it, the door's always open for sure. That yep. also needs to go through the right path though, right? Like that's why clubs have their presidents in place. You're 100% right, yeah. And that's why there's very strict protocols of communication within the game. So FQ talks to certain people only within yep. a club because those certain people represent the interests of the club. They've been voted to be the voice of the club. That's right. right. And what, what we find all of the time is that we will respond to those elected officials within a club um, and um, put forward a particular outcome. And the very people within that club are the ones that then go and scream and yell at us yep. on, on, in a social media environment um, when it was the, the, the club president who specifically asked us to do something. So there is a general disconnect between what are the interests of a club, mm. what does a club want versus what does the participant of that club want. Is there too much emphasis or is it from a participant's point of view, is there too much thought of my opinion is the one that matters? It's not because obviously you're taking care of the participants but via the clubs, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that isn't that a societal problem? Mm. Yes. So it's got nothing to do with football. There's um, there's there's general uh, issues across society. It doesn't matter whether it's sport or otherwise, whether it's school or whether it's workplaces or, or otherwise. It's there are always elements that are. Um, it's all about me yep. and what my my opinion is the most important. I don't care what the club wants or the club president wants, or you know, or, or the region of Queensland football wants. My opinion is the most valid one, and so. Without getting into and you know the, the rabbit hole of those discussions, um, it does make putting forward um, a, a positive perception of the sport more broadly very difficult because we have three hundred thousand people who play football in Queensland. Um, it is impossible to try and make three hundred thousand people uh, happy, yeah. and we absolutely do not attempt to do that. We just try and make most of the people happy by delivering. Um, the best outcomes for the game. And we focus on uh, the things that are really required to within our strategic plan. So participation growth, women and girls growth, infrastructure growth, government relations, all of the things that are very well documented, that's what we do. Yeah, on the participation piece, there's been quite a few posts on social media recently, but sort of since the turn of the year about the growth in participation. Were there any like specific targets that were targeted? coming into this year? Uh, yeah, all of it. <laughs> um, uh, well, yeah, so there's there's probably about, you know, 20 or 30 different metrics that we measure every year through a census process. And 2023 saw an increase in every single one of those metrics. So it was an absolute remarkable year for football. And this year, by all accounts, we're, we're already exceeding on path to exceeding all of those. So those uh, moving uh, the dial on those metrics is really ultimately what we focus on. Um, football is extraordinarily extraordinarily esoteric, so it's extraordinarily complex, and I don't think there's an appreciation for how complex it actually is. It's a it's a wide variety of systems built on other systems, built on other systems, built on other systems, and they all impact each other. And um, what we have to do is is invest carefully and strategically into the right things, so that we can shift the needle in the things that matter, and that's ultimately participation growth historically, but equally now um, the, you know, the focus of Football Queensland over the next five years, apart from key, key particip participation measures, is, is infrastructure. And um, we've had some great success with that in the last few years. And um, it announced even just today it was the latest infrastructure round funding from the state government. And um, we saw eight and a half million dollars of that go to football. So those, those clubs will be finding out and, you know, over the last 24 hours that, that they've been successful. And that's, that's a huge outcome, eight and a half million dollars. Like we've had more funding in the last three years for football than the previous 30 put together. That's massive. But with the participation like and your metrics and whatnot and your, in, I guess your data, has that increase been statewide or like this, do you get to see that across the whole state, not just southeast Queensland, obviously <laughs> – us and our, myself growing up in country Queensland, which is very rugby league dominated. Um, how's the growth of the game looking 
I guess, further north of, say, the Sunshine Coast. Excellent. Yeah. So it, it is varied, of course, yeah. um, because there's different factors at play in different parts of Queensland, but the results and the increases have been everywhere. Some are greater in other areas and, and some are not. Yeah. Um, parts of regional Queensland have, have different challenges, um, uh, less to do with competing sports and more to do with, um, uh, I guess, how they spend their recreational time yeah. is interesting, particularly in parts of um, you know central Queensland and, and even north Queensland. So like they only like doing certain things at certain times of the year for sport, and other things they like doing you know things that uh, um, you know camping and fishing and all the wonderful things that you can do in regional Queensland that you can't do here. So um, the growth rates are always different, um, and. I guess the, the ability for us to be able to tailor different solutions for different parts of Queensland is, a, is an outcome of a lot of the changes that happened with the recent reforms. We're able to put good investment in, but at the same time, it's, it's tailored for local solutions. So growth rates are all over the place, but they're all going in the right direction finally, because that wasn't happening a few uh, years ago. It was very static, if not going back. Well, I guess to, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, I guess okay. a lot of the, negative social media feedback from Football Queensland would have been from those areas further north on the coast because yeah. it seems like it's so southeast Queensland dominated with all the sort of, I guess, the funding and whatnot that I know just still being in contact with a few people and seeing it on social media myself, there would have been a lot of, there's a lot of people jumping up and down about like, what about me? What about us? Like obviously the <laughs> MPL clubs like Townsville, Cairns, Mackay now um, sort of, Yep. not existing anymore in terms of the Nash, the MPL competition. Yep. Um, the pyramid in general. Yeah, the yeah. pyramid in general, which yeah. I guess we'll touch on a bit later on. But Yeah, yeah, uh, we can do it now or later on if you like. It's up to you. Well, we can so. touch on it right now if you want. <laughs> it's your show. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well whilst, whilst it's, all, <laughs> it's all on the table, yeah. we might as oh, well, well we may as well, yeah. So I guess how's it, how's it all looking like in terms of, to me personally, I think the MPL's finally reached its – market in terms of it's now the strongest competition in Queensland. It's unfortunate that those local teams, I guess, are no longer in there. Yep. Um, but I do applaud Football Queensland in the end of season competition with the Champions of Champions with the FQPL. Gives those young guys an opportunity because I know I'm no I'm no competition director or anything like that, but you can tell the financial burden of those of obviously the federation and then those local clubs to sort of be involved in the MPL. Yeah. And I guess there's there's a there's a, there's a complex answer to the to I guess to what you've asked. Um, when we look at designing competitions it's it's um, say the MPL for example how in the past there were some regional elements to that. And and now we made over the last couple of years with the competition reforms we made some very very deliberate strategic choices and that was to invest in conferences of football and build capability build capacity build technical outcomes in regional clubs within conferences because what happens and what has happened historically whether it's um you know one of the several regional mpl clubs that have come into existence and then gone out of existence is they haven't delivered on ultimately the strategic objectives of why they were there in the first place and everyone can argue emotionally about um, having a team involved in the premier competition and what that brings. But at the end of the day, we have to look at it and go, we can't make football about one club. We need to make football about the entire region's clubs. We need to improve all of their technical outcomes. We need to provide more services to build their coaching capabilities. We need to bring, allow more kids from the regions to spend longer in the regions building their technical capability so that they don't think when I get to 14 or 15, my only future in football is to move to Brisbane. Yeah. And in some cases, if you're absolutely off the charts, brilliant, of course that happens. Um, but ultimately our ambitions are to, to not just have an NPL level competition in Southeast Queensland. We want a strong competition of, at a FQPL level in central and up north. And to do that, we had to sever the ties and change where we invest and how we invest. And um, we're now seeing, uh, particularly in North Queensland, in, in Cairns and Townsville, 
we're seeing clubs um, invest heavily in their in their juniors, which is which is where you start building that capability from. Um, we're seeing clubs participating in the FQ Academy uh, assessment process now in regional Queensland. That never would have happened before, ever. We've now got multiple clubs doing that, um, which is brilliant. So the, in- the intended outcome of um, the strategy is working. Uh, we had almost no kids from uh, Whitsunday Coast and Mackay region in state teams. Now we do. We have uh, massive amounts of regional kids represented in the Queensland teams. Before, that just simply wasn't the case. So the technical infrastructure didn't exist. The academy system didn't exist. Um, the focus was on one team, not five. Mm. That's where we believe we'll get better football outcomes, for not only for the state, but for those regions. So ultimately, that's better for us as a code than having a team that brings in players from other parts of yeah. Queensland, which was effectively a rep team. Yeah, it was. I, I think it lost its... Essentially, when we were growing up, <clears throat> the the state league was an end-of-season competition where it essentially was a rep team. Like, it would bring in some teams from Brisbane, like, I know, Rochdale and Strikers, so, Pine, yeah. Pine Rivers and that when they yeah. were strong were involved. So, essentially, it was a rep team. So, you'd have all the best players in your local competition still playing in your local competition. Then, at the end of the season, you get picked for the yeah. rep side. Unfortunately, when the NPL kicked in and QSL, QSL it, it really did affect um, the local competition because all your best players left and then the local competition became a bit of a, it was, you know, it was completely diluted. Yeah. yeah. So I do agree with you, like yeah. that sort of strategy. And I think on the surface, you'll get, you always get that negativity of people jumping up and down. I know we would all love to see a strong regional yeah, teams strong team, yeah. to be, to include all of Queensland, but it definitely makes sense when you sort of pull the layers yeah. back about the fun, the foundations for the, yeah, especially think, the juniors. Yeah, I think, but when you look at the FQ Academy carnival system, um, that's, you have teams at all age groups, boys and girls, represented at those state carnivals now. And that gives every kid in those regions an opportunity to be identified and, um, and categorised, as the case may be, and go through the talent ID system for selection all the way through to, you know, 18s. Yeah. Um, so that's now in place and, and functioning as intended. So, it's, again, I think you highlight one of the challenges of administering football is there's a, there's a broad group of stakeholders who all have differing opinions. And there's, um, you can focus on what the road ahead looks like with um, modern systems of talent ID and player development, or you can cling to the past. You can cling to, oh, football used to be like this 20 years ago. It used to be like this. This is It was great when we did it like this. Um, that's really not a way of uh, administering the game, and we have to focus on a holistic strategy that considers a broad range of things because it's not just the academy system. It's then how we deliver and coach education regionally. What does that look like? Um, we've invested massively in there. We now have pro-licensed technical directors in, um, in right across regional Queensland. We didn't have them three years ago. We have a licensed technical directors in every region. We didn't have that three years ago either. So it's part of a bigger system that now needs to work and let through the passage of time, bring lift the capability mm. of clubs and bring players through. It's also like... It's got to be that much more difficult given that Queensland's such a big state. Like you talk about Victoria, New South Wales, even like regional clubs from Sydney or Melbourne, a couple hours drive away, potentially. Regional clubs in Queensland, a yep. few hours flight. You know, talk about Cairns, that's what, three and a half hours on a plane? Oh, something like a bit that. Over two, two yeah. A bit over two. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. Like, well, you, you, you know, know what I mean? Like like you're speaking New big South Wales dust and they've got a northern New, northern New South yeah, Wales NPL split. is split in half. And it's a it's a much, much yeah. smaller state than ours. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, there's only so much you can do, I guess. Hey, yeah. Who'd be the CEO of Football Queensland? Huh? Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> hey, there we go. <laughs> um, Rob, I'm, I'm going to get to a subject that if we were to have put out, uh, ask, <laughs> ask uh, Rob any questions... I'll guarantee that more than half um, would have been squatty related. All right. So with with squatty, what what issues, if you find any issues, what are the main issues with squatty that, that people can't seem to get? Um, are the issues as bad as what people say? 
And are other states using Squaddy um, as their tool for registration? Well, there's a few questions in that. <laughs> start with the first one. What are the issues? Yeah. I'll start with the first one. Like, like anything, it's change. So that's that's fundamentally issue yeah. number one. Is it's change from uh, a an ecosystem of fragmented systems that have been in place for a very long time. Yeah. So um, you know whether it's game day, whether it's play football, whether it's schedule, or whether it, and there's a broad range in between all of that um, that weren't integrated but people were familiar with. And the the longer someone was at a club or as a club administrator, the more familiar they are. So the more um, uh, the more habituated they were to those systems. You get used to something. Very used to it. So more, more likely to be resistant to, to change. So those systems had been failing football for a very right. long time. Not, they were just, they were not just failing us, they were holding us back. They were, they were, an, they were an anchor around yeah. the game. Um, we, well, not only Football Queensland, but every member federation was being um, paralysed by it. So there's been... Uh, national change and, and movement in um, a, a wide variety of these systems. But ultimately, uh, our objective with whatever platform um, needed to be chosen is we were looking for, for two things. A system that allows us to transform the way we manage football as, a, as an organisation. And secondly, uh, transform the way that clubs manage themselves. And to do those, get those two outcomes, we wanted um, or required an integrated system. So something that brought together all elements of football into one platform. So from um, from fixturing competitions, from scheduling referee appointments, um, from paying and purchasing for uh, uh, whether it's um, apparel or whether it's canteens, um, every part of football uh, or activity within football, we wanted to have it integrated into a single platform. Yep. Um, because football and how it's managed is highly resource intensive. So the more complex and the more services, um, the more resources are required, the more expensive it becomes to manage. And the more that that happens is uh, puts upward pressure on fees. Yep. We don't, obviously don't want that. We're trying to put downward pressure on fees. So we needed a system that allowed us to do that and working with WSA um, gave us that opportunity. Now, we can talk about how that um, was implemented and there can be many people who have a detracting position on yeah. that, but the environment that it was implemented was very complex because it wasn't just involving ourselves, it was involving uh, Football Australia, it was involving other platforms. Those platforms were failing around us. They're the other systems. That's right. So they were failing around us at a time when we were trying to transition to a new system. So the the information that was coming from from play football was was rarely accurate. Profiles, the player profiles, all of those things were coming across from that system um, in a fashion which was almost impossible to deal yep. with, and it was paralysing. So the, the the very reasons why we um, needed the system were still plaguing us once we'd moved across. So um, our ability to transition was extremely difficult. Um, there was no escaping that though. Yeah. So we, 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 we couldn't pick a better time that somehow that was going to be better because that environment still exists. So when the, forgive us, I'm not a, someone who does the registrations, a club sister. Um, so when Squatty came in, there were still other uh, registration tools being used at that point were you able to just say right this is squatty everyone has to go with this and this alone or did there have to be some kind of um room for maneuver because it was yeah. yeah are you referring to like between us and play football are you talking between clubs and Club. the system yeah um yeah look that's that's an interesting question so um the, the, that that itself also posed another layer of complexity yeah. so we were we were trying to obviously develop a transition from play football to uh, to squatty but at the same time a small number of clubs about 10 percent use um, third-party systems and they have for some years 
that equally caused and still continues to cause a, a great um, uh, issue, a, a great amount of problems uh, across the platform. And to sort of unpack your original questions a little bit, what are the issues? And, and, I, and I put it to, to one primarily, it's change, change of process, yeah. change of system, uh, change ordering of, of um, how we do things and why. Um, but ultimately, um, we analyze very carefully the support requests that come into, um, uh, into Football Queensland, the volumes, the, the, every single granular detail you can think of because we look at it to try and determine what's actually going on with the platform. And the reality is, is um, a large volume of, of uh, the current challenges that we face come from 10% of clubs. Yeah. So that's that's the reality. That's um, and when I'm talking large volume, I'm talking you know, 90 percent of all issues come from a very very small number of clubs. Yeah. So that um, presents, a, I guess, a very clear position that the They're broader platform itself. It. What's that? Are they fighting against it? Is that why the problems are coming from those clubs? Um, or- yeah, well, it's, I mean, you put what in, their or? motivations would be might might differ from club to club. So, yeah, okay. I, without without, uh, I don't have uh, enough of a reason or an understanding of why some of them do. I do know why some do it, um, but why all of them might do it, it just it's just uh, familiarity mm-hmm. and um, you know lack of resources to fully adopt it. But clubs who have fully adopted it as intended, um, you know, as recently as a couple of weeks ago to a club meeting, just said we've fully adopted it end to end. We've absolutely had absolutely no issues whatsoever since doing it, and the the challenge is is that um, we take on the feedback of of all clubs who want to put forward um, what their concerns are, what their challenges are. We look very 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 carefully at the support tickets. We we track everything, um, but the volume is very much contained to a small number, and and that does uh, I guess present a particular very clear point of view is that um, the issues, 95% of those issues are operator error. Yeah, I was going to say like out of that support request you're talking about how much it was due to the error because there's a lot of, let's be honest, there's a lot of technical dinosaurs still getting around who 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 would run run their lives off a Why are you looking at me when you say that? But it, it is it's whether it's whether it's user error or otherwise it still represents a, a challenge for for the game because um, it spreads a, a broad range of negativity across the platform and its use um, it makes onboarding new clubs and new people more complex yeah. because of their understanding but that the, it's a challenge between new systems and old systems and we're trying to transition clubs to new ways of operating that are in line with a more modern, dynamic and agile system where there's greater transparency, greater accountability. And those things scare some. They scare some people and they scare yep. some clubs. And that's that's the reality. But we have to work with them to sell the benefits of um, why you would transition to, to this environment because it's not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Um, and we're, we're in it... Uh, last year, we developed over 200 modifications to the system. This year will be similar. We've got a very, very clear journey that we're going on with technology and why. And it can either paralyze um, an organization when you get it wrong, uh, or it can, in the case of um, many companies out there, can unlock incredible amounts of opportunity. And where we're seeing it deployed properly, that's the outcome. So. But that's something that we have to work with clubs with in the coming six to 12 months um, and have them better understand the benefits when it's used as intended. Is it, and look, I might be being naive asking the question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, can you not, if you know that the issue is that certain clubs, say 10%, are using another system alongside squatting and that's where the problems are, are, are you able to just, basically put it out there and say from 2025 you're not I'm using off. you're not using any other systems it has to be this one this is the problem just use that one it'll be fine oh, look that's entirely possible and, and it's absolutely one of the options that are in front of us um, we haven't made that decision just yet but but I think what you've um, what you've sort of flagged as being an issue is is um, 
clubs are duplicating, if not triplicating, the amount of work they're doing by running duplicate systems. And not only are they triplicating the, the resource load on their volunteers, they're actually making it more confusing for their participants and players who are then having to re-register back into Squatty in an environment which doesn't match the original place they registered in. So they're registering to the wrong products, they're yep. registering to the wrong competitions, and then they're deregistering. The whole thing is a, is a circus. And that participants having issues as well, right? So That's, they're complaining. And then, they're, then the participants having a terrible time and complaining, mm -hmm. and then there's, there's refunds which then overload the system here of us having to process refunds. So th th that outcome in the ecosystem is is not good for anyone. Yep. And when you're dealing with those amount of um, user error support tickets, um, it creates resource burden in this organisation, which you're then not able to service properly, adding additional cost. When the very intent was to streamline yeah. and integrate, take the yeah. pain away. Take, take the pain easy. away. So. The pain's been taken away from a lot of clubs and it's working effectively, but we obviously have more work to do um, in uh, working with the clubs who um, uh, who uh, still have um, a desire to use uh, other systems. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I bring it back to a point I made earlier. It's you have an environment where you've had the same administrator at a club for 10 to 12 years, 15 years. They don't want to change. Yeah. So, and um, that's very difficult to do. So it's very difficult to, to work through that process, but it's something that we have to do. So at the end of the day, this is a system that we're, we're yep. using to progress the game. Um, it will evolve and it's evolving monthly uh, in perfectly in line with, with um, uh, I guess our development um, uh, agenda. And, uh, and as that unfolds, more and more clubs will see the benefit. So speaking of, people seeing the benefit um how many other states use squatty at this moment in time and are any yeah. transitioning to it or yeah absolutely so um so northern new south wales which you mentioned uh, use it um football west use it there's zones and associations in new south wales who use it um i think you'll find in the next next few weeks another um significantly large member federation uh will, will start using it as well um it will ultimately represent the bulk of the states and participation in Australia, but it's also the same platform as used by all of netball in Australia or right. basketball in Australia. Yeah, I was going to say I've seen like a few. Yeah, other it's the same. Codes. So it's it, it's across most of the major codes, uh, albeit you know for for a different sport. But also, it's um, the platform is um, probably going to be the largest system in the US as well. Mm. So uh, globally, it is um, the benchmark system. And there, there is no equivalent um, um, for a number of different reasons. Um, but for us, most importantly, it's what does it mean for, for our ability to transform how we operate? That's the key to unlocking value. And that's what's coming in, in the weeks and months ahead. So tell me if, I'm, if this isn't a question that should be asked on here. You can ask any question. Because um, yeah. we, we squat it. The only, the only time I've used it is to log myself in as a player. I, I don't, I've yeah. used it from a an admin point of view, so I don't know, but are there any benefits, say, financially to clubs to not use it, to stick to what they're doing, to potentially keep information? Financial keep benefits of not using it? Yeah. Uh, well, of course there is. <laughs> to, yeah, as in to hide information potentially and, and save themselves from having to... Well, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a, that's another another issue. That's, that's a, that is a very real issue, um, uh, and it's an unfortunate one that... Um, that a small number of clubs um, don't register their players in line with the um, the national regulations and FIFA statutes and licensing and affiliation. So, what that means is, um, uh, you know, they're they're hiding registrations for for a number of different reasons, and the rest of the football community is essentially um, paying for covering them, covering them. Yeah. yeah, for for the costs of the game aren't borne by all of its participants. It's only borne by those. Um, who are doing the right who thing. Who are doing the right thing, yeah. yeah. So um, so there are, yes, a number of reasons that are not always related directly related to usability of the system. Um, and, uh, again, we will be working with those clubs uh, in the coming months about uh, closing closing the uh, the loop on that conduct. Yeah. 
Yeah, so it's, so, hard, it's hard to sort of force people to engage unless if there's a cutoff point or something like that. Isn't it? So, yeah, so I, I'm just going to say it's it's a big claim that that's, I suppose, the reason clubs are doing it. Um, but yeah, you, oh, you've actually just got to, access to... Yeah. We sent a memo to yeah. clubs only, what, a week or two ago, yeah. highlighting that very issue. Yeah. Um, so it's we're, we're, we're putting it out there very clearly to say, look, we, we know this is happening. Mm. You know you're not supposed to be doing it. So it's not something that is, um, you know, sitting in the subterfuge, you know, not being talked about. Yeah. We are being transparent. And the data's there too. So it's not like you're, it's not like you're making uneducated claims or putting yeah. memos. Yeah, I think that's reason. what I was going with that. Oh, sorry. Big claim. <laughs> yeah. But um, but so it's the data's it, there. Sort of the data's thing. there. You can actually see kind of what's going on here, um, and that a support. So that potentially is a reason why the system's not working because people are trying to get if, around it. If there's so many participants, but then this many regos getting paid, it's pretty clear to see that not everyone's paid for, isn't it? Like, yeah. Well, it's it's a matter of um, yes. So if you've got a, if you're a, a club with a thousand players, but you you know you you clearly claim that you have 1500 players where are those 500 players yeah and that's um, reasonably um, common in certain areas yeah. it's not common more broadly across yeah. the state but some of the larger environments where um, that's absolutely occurring yeah so and it's very it's very visible and easy to see yeah and and potentially I mean clubs who are going to choose to do that they're only doing damage to themselves future wise right? I, well, of course, but there's there's also not? child safety issues. There's member protection issues. There's um, public liability issues. So they're not being insured technically if if a player hasn't been registered through. We're talking kids as well, right? It's the correct it's, channels. There's an insurance issue here. There is this, but there's kids and parents and anyone involved who is going to the club um, in an unregistered environment. So it's not just insurance. It's there's a whole lot of other risks associated with yeah. that activity that um, everyone else is wearing the risk on that. Yeah. Except for the um, except for the actual people doing the wrong thing. So there, there's a whole broad range of issues. But then there's there's coaching courses that are delivered. There's all of the things that are being paid for. Um, but there's no there's no corresponding registration commitment that's coming in order to pay for those services. Mm. So it's it really is doing a disservice to the game, and um, more broadly, I think it's doing a disservice to the customer experience. So because um, the risks aren't being accounted for properly. Yep. All so right. That's, uh, that's squatty. Yeah. That's squatty. But look, just, just to finish on that, I do yeah. want to recognise it has been a difficult 12 to 18 months um, with the change of the system. There's, yeah. no, there's no doubt about it. There's no – that comes with change. And, and for, for everyone out there um, who's um, had issues or who's who, who hasn't understood the transformation process, um, of of course, we're absolutely uh, uh, cognizant of that. We we have been listening to the feedback. We do reflect on it constantly, and we when when issues come from um, an update or a bug or something that happens because of that transformation, the, the team act on it very quickly. But it's yeah. not these processes aren't seamless. Yeah, and they are a journey, and that is absolutely one thing that needs to be said. We are going on a journey. It's not something that we just picked up off the shelf and said. We want that, and it is as, as it is. It was we need this system because we want to evolve it to where we need it to be because of the direction we're taking the game. So, um, I think that needs to be reflected yep. on as well. Maybe um, yeah, everyone paid their regos. You can maybe afford a better onboarding experience. <laughs> well, and that that you is said a, it. You, know, you don't have that, to. That, that is that is a particular point. Of <laughs> Just the the final thing on squatting. I know that when this comes out, people will ask us the question that we should have asked that. So just in a warm word, a yes or no answer, um, was there a better way to roll it out? Yes or no? I think no. Cool. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. done. Yeah, because if there was, I would have done it. Yeah. Done. All right. Um, okay, so we touched upon clubs who might not be doing the right thing there. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Sunshine Coast Fire. <laughs> um, what is the situation with so Sunshine Coast Fire are no longer – in the the pyramid um they're not in qpl1 uh, what actually happened there because there's a lot of i suppose rumor conjecture whatever you want to call it um 
what what actually happened in, in your own words? <laughs> um, look, I, I think some parts of that will be um, difficult to answer in the sense that, you know, I, I don't like to give specific reflections on yep. individuals or clubs um, because it's as a governing body, it's important that we don't do that. But if, if you want me to give you a general um, point of view, obviously, um, from a licensed club point of view, licenses are, uh, are offered for one year and one year only to yep. all clubs. That's not that's not unique to Queensland. It's the global system of licensing is one year. Um, those decisions around who are licensed can change year on year yep. for different reasons. Um, whilst I can't go specifically into the reasons around the fire. Um, their decision to participate or not to participate in, you know, other competitions w- was theirs. So right. um, they were offered affiliation and, and rejected it. Right. So you didn't revoke, you didn't kick them out of the league. Are you talking about QPL or are you talking about more broadly the club? Uh, QPL. QPL. Yeah. So the, the, the license wasn't renewed for, for QPL. Yeah. But for all, all other teams, so across you know potentially community football or any other football, yeah. um, affiliation was offered to the club, and they they didn't um, they didn't want to affiliate to Football Queensland. Right. So if you don't affiliate to Football Queensland, you obviously can't participate in any of our competitions. Why that is, I mean that's a matter for the club, and it would have been a decision that they made at the end of the day. So I um, I don't know the reasoning behind that. Yeah, but they were. Their license for QBL was revoked. Well, the, there's just, revokes. Um, there's no no such there's thing no such thing. They, because it wasn't renewed. That's that's correct. By yeah. Football Queensland. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'll just, no. No. That's all right. Be there for a second. No. 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 So just just <laughs> so that's clear. You know? So yeah. So there's no no license is ever revoked. Is yeah, they it's, can either be renewed or not renewed. The federation decided to not that's renew right. their license. Yeah. Okay. So and it's not the first time that that's happened. I mean, we've obviously done that done it, yeah. in, in many other circumstances because um, for for a number of different reasons. Yeah. Reasons we can't. Yeah, so uh, yeah, fa- f- finishing <laughs> off on that one, yeah. I think that's probably the answer that we need to be able to move on because uh, we probably can't say too much else. Rumour might get us into trouble. Unless if you know something, we'll leave it. <laughs> Stick around for the uncut yeah. portion. <laughs> um, <laughs> National Second Division, there's been a lot of buzz about it for a couple of years now, but mm-hmm. there's been a bit of a perception and like most things, usually on social media, that perhaps FQ haven't been backing the clubs um, who wanted to get involved. Is that the case or not so much? No. Well, <laughs> Fire being one. Yeah. That was well, the main one. Yeah. Well, yeah. Following well, on from the last question. Segue. Yeah. yeah, look, I think I think you, uh, you know, if we go back to opening remarks again about public opinion, social media um, and the mob, um, there's absolutely no evidence anywhere either that's been documented from Football Queensland Publicly, privately, or um, uh, or verbally, that we didn't support clubs. Like that's there's absolutely no evidence anywhere that that's the case. But again, someone on social media decides to um, spread a particular position because it's in their interest to do so, and then that spreads around as it does, yeah. mm-hmm. and <laughs> it's just a lie built on a lie built on a lie what, built on a what lie. Would, like. What would clubs like? What support would F- clubs be like seeking from FQ? Like it said, I don't know. This is just me talking yeah. out loud, um, or thinking out loud rather. <laughs> talking out loud. Well, I'm also talking out loud. It could be like, public endorsement of their beer. Yeah, but like, so, what's yeah. that going to do? Essentially, at the end of the day, it's a club's decision. It's the clubs that are financially going to have to foot the bill. Like they're not yeah. football queen. They can go, oh, you, we really like good on you guys. Like. All the best, but what else? What I don't know. What yeah. else? But as the governing body, we um, that process needed to be an independent process of selection and criteria run by Football Australia. Yeah, we're not going to come out and publicly pick winners for Queensland and pick one bid over another bid or endorse one publicly over another club publicly. Yeah, that should absolutely not be something that we yeah. do, and no one would expect us to do it. But um, certain negative sentiments were being deliberately disseminated and and it and it happens often in these circumstances where if a club's bid was deficient in some capacity and their likelihood of success was low the easiest way to defer responsibility is to buy is to put it onto a third party mm. 
And the easy, easy victim in this case is let's just target the governing body. It's their fault that our bid didn't stack up. It's their fault that uh, we're deficient in these areas. Now, I'm not saying that's what any of those clubs did specifically. It could have been individuals attached to those clubs. I don't know. But either way, none of those things are true. We absolutely supported clubs where we were asked to in certain ways. Um, I spoke regularly, regularly to many of the presidents involved, um, weekly in some cases, um, to provide support to them when they would ask us questions and um, uh, proactively uh, engaging with Football Australia to provide the right contextual um, uh, reflections on on each of those clubs. So we were enormously active in um, the assembly of the national second tier model. We were working on uh, in working groups with Football Australia for the two years leading up to it. Um, enormously proactive and strongly supportive of a national second tier. Um, so the suggestion that somehow we were um, roadblocking some is just an absolute nonsense argument that's not supported by any evidence whatsoever. Uh, just to double down on that, I'm kind of in that email trail at, at Powered at, at a high level for that kind of conversation. Uh, 100% um, Football Queensland offered whatever support was required for our bid. And in the end, ultimately, we, we didn't end up you know, going to the next stage. But uh, it certainly wasn't for the lack of support that yourself and Football Queensland to give. So uh, I will go on record and say that. Yeah, um, It's a social media thing that you, we keep talking about. It's like mm. it's easy to blame the governing body knowing that if they choose to bite back in public, they're going to look like idiots by doing that. I mean, it's the easy like thing as well. We'll nah, just do it. The, the easy yeah. thing as well. And I'm pretty pretty sure that that particular, the, the first rumour, that one particular club that we may or may have already not spoke about, um, that, but the rumour came from a different state, a club at a different state, and that's where it filtered out of. A state that runs with Victoria, potentially. Yeah, it might have. <laughs> um, might not. But that's that's where the, the whole rumour came from. And let's face it, on social media, we keep talking social media, it is a societal thing. We're all, we're all guilty it's of it. It's a massive um, thing. But yeah. you're such an easy target, Football Queensland, in the current landscape yes. where it's very well, easy it's just those, to throw stones. So as Lance said that, you, if you do something well, you're doing your job. Hmm. If you do something poorly, then oh, yeah. the... It just gets the knives come that's, out. That's what I was saying. Like when you're the very first question about, you know, do you do you struggle with it or do you wish it was different? Like, does any part of you wish that you could do this job without social media being a thing? <laughs> um, look, yes and no. I mean, the the reality is, it's I don't wish for for things to be different. It is it is the environment that and the 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 world that we live in. It's part of it, whether you like it or not. You can't. You can't wish for people to treat each other better. You can't wish for people to stop abusing referees. You can't wish for people to stop taking violent, having violent conduct towards, um, you know, under 18 uh, female referees on the weekend. That, that it's disgusting and they do it. How do you, we're, we're, we need to be strong on that. Equally, we need to be strong on bad conduct on social media. Mm -hmm. And all of us have a responsibility in, in changing the nature of the conversations we have about football. Um, we need to make them more sophisticated. And the more sophisticated conversations you can have, the more you drown out that nonsense because yeah. they just look like fools. And at the end of the day, the, the more sensible people having more sensible discussions, um, that's where I think we need to go as opposed to find ways of of um, appeasing the mob. Yeah. So have no interest in doing that at all. So... Um, it's not a concern around having social media and the, and, um, and and what it does. It's more concerning for me as to one: how do we protect our people from it? How do we protect our referees? And then how do we lift the conversation to a different standard? Yeah. yeah. So Good that answer. that needs to, that's what needs to happen. Yeah. I mean, effectively, we are a social media. So Correct. Well, you you can use a positive as well, which tonight we've clearly all been, is. We've all, we've all been critical of. 
Football Queensland, I think, on our show um, at times. Yeah. It's never been, as you said, like it, it can take, it can step over the line and become personal. It's never personal. It's always like our opinion in terms of what we can see or what we hear around the traps. Once you get into the actual information, you start to realise like, yeah, actually, no, nah, there's a lot more to this. Yes. And that's the, that's the thing, it's educating. Yeah. And that's what I think I hope that comes of this episode is that a lot of people that maybe are outspoken with criticism can actually see well, actually, there is a lot of moving wheels and, and well, issues within issues at, to actually run a at whole least, state's yeah, competition. At least get a bit of context, if not anything 100%. else. 100%. Yeah, look, yeah. And, and you're entitled to be critical of Football Queensland. Like, no one, no one's suggesting that you can't be. Um, the, the, the the thing is is that you, you debate the issues yeah, in a constructive correct. way yeah. and you, you open yourself up for different viewpoints about the issue well, because not everyone knows everything about football no. and... Um, working in an insular environment where you're just listening to the same voices all of the time doesn't take the game forward. Yeah. So be open to criticism, which which we absolutely are. But when someone comes to us and says, um, here are some ideas that I have about this this issue here or this issue there, they're, they're, they're absolutely welcomed and we welcome those debates. We welcome having uh, any constructive um, discussion about football with anyone, anytime. But when you start playing the man, mm. you've automatically lost the argument. Well, I think you have no argument. That's the whole thing of a debate, right, is there's always two sides. You can't. I can't stand people that want to have a debate and then when you disagree with their side, it becomes ugly. And I think that's what we what, – that's what I see on the social media pages within Football Queensland. Not Football Queensland, but yeah. our sort of community is there tends to be a lot of debates that go on. But if you've got a different opinion to me – then you become the bad guy. That's not what a debate is. Um, so I think some people just need to well, pull their what, heads in that's at what times. Social media is. If you don't it is, but media, like wrong, there is wrong. so many positives to yeah. social media if it's used in the right way. Yeah. Um, which is you're never going to get that. But I think it, we can tonight try. we can have a debate and we can agree, disagree, get to the bottom of things, and we all just want the code to be successful. And that that's the whole point. Right? I think our whole podcast actually started out. Um, we just wanted, you know, to share stories about end of season trips and yeah. cup finals, and it's definitely, and then evolved. down the track, it, it actually, yes. I think, it kind we, of changed. We've become to, slightly more sensible. It would, yeah. Well, we're more about a good product for yeah. the game, yeah. and I think you know, a chat like this tonight, whilst um, we could easily come in with a, a particular viewpoint, we have to come in very open minded and say, well, look. well, I think that's the, that's the that's the beauty of what we've got is we we don't have an agenda. Yeah, we're pretty open minded, and we 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 like to chat about football. Yeah, the three best. three of us will disagree at times. Yeah, we'll all have different opinions. That's all fine. Time. Yeah, yeah, we always disagree Sorry. with Ben. Always. Yes, yeah. you two always disagree with me, but that's just bullying. Yeah, exactly. I take it to um, the HR manager. Just on the the social media one, I do have a question. Um, the 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 Twitter spat, fallout, disagreement, debate, whatever you want to call it. With Scott McDonald, do you regret that going public? Um, would it not? Well, you can ask, answer that straight away. Um, but the follow up, I suppose, would it not have been better to invite him in for a chat? So, look, let's work through what the issues are. Or oh, it's an interesting, interesting question. Um, yeah, where do I start with that? Uh, look, I, I think. I think the I think the the describer of it is probably um, is probably a little bit um, uh, over the top in the sense that it wasn't a spat. Um, uh, it was you know it, it, Scott made a comment and and I I made one response um, and that was the end of it. And um, uh, you know for a number of different reasons, um, you know I chose to engage with him because. Mm. Uh, we talked about the benefits. I'll come back to that in a second. We talk about the benefits of social media yeah. and the negatives. One of the benefits is is that anyone in anyone in football, in my case, can engage with with me on social yeah. media, and and that happens often. Someone will put forward a constructive question, and I'll respond constructively. Uh, in other cases, where um, someone else in a position of um, uh, of uh, seniority within the game says something that's incorrect. As the CEO, I should have an opportunity to to correct them as well. Yeah. So um, we can argue, you know, I think we can argue how that occurred and, and why. 
But at the end of the day, um, uh, the way that I responded, I thought was was bland enough, um, and uh, you know potentially um, some would have seen it as a you know a, a, in different ways because they cast a particular lens over over um, either Scott or myself. Yeah, and um, at the end of it, there was not there, nothing came of that. Yeah, there was no other follow up discussion. There was no meeting of sorts there was no um for me animosity between him or myself yeah um so do i regret it the answer is no i mean because i'm 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 entitled to stand up for the game if incorrect um positions are being put forward i mean I, i i think i should ultimately correct those circumstances and um particularly whether it's a a journalist or a commentator or uh, whoever's prominent within the game, uh, that should be something that you would expect from from a CEO. Yeah, I mean, that's that's my particular point of view. I mean, mm. you can, I'm, I'm sure you guys probably disagree with that. And go, let's. You can no, I, I, I just look. My personal view on that would be, um, it 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 could have inflamed a situation that maybe didn't need inflaming. Um, so yeah. that that would be my point. That's, yeah. that's all I would say. Yeah, it's interesting. With like taking it back, it doesn't matter, you know, um, whether it's whether whether it's Scott or anyone. I don't I don't have uh, uh, any personal grievances mm. with 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 Scott, um, but it doesn't matter whether it's him or anyone. It's I, I'd still probably do the same thing again, yeah. um, because if incorrect positions are continually perpetuated across uh, the public domain, then individuals who aren't aware of the facts will continue to perpetuate falsehoods. Yeah. And we get into a circle of, like we talked about, um, the National Second Division position, where someone says one thing that's false and virally it perpetuates. So if you don't, in certain circumstances, put forward a, a factual position, then you, you do run the risk of potentially Allowing Just people to think that it was correct. Uh, that's right. Yeah. People assume that it's correct, um, and and ultimately, you know, it, it, we 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 moved on from there, and that's sort of ancient history. Um, so, you know, I I, I, uh, I I do my best to engage in, in a way that um, is engaging, um, but at the same time, um, I, I try and find a balance of being open to discussion uh, for those that want to put forward cool. valid points and valid arguments. Well, for people who want to have a discussion, they'll just well, that's chuck right. their opinion at you. Yeah. 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 Um, just want to, I think we, we've probably gone through a lot of the, uh, the the bigger issues that people would talk about. So now just probably a few more that are um, a little bit lighter, but still discussion points anyway. Sure. Um, I came up with an idea uh, about four or five so weeks can. ago on the podcast. You've heard it before, lads. Don't worry. Um, the oh, Cattle right. Pro Series. So yeah. we've seen a lot of blowouts at the start of the season. So your, your weeks one, two, and three, which effectively form what used to be pre-season. pre-season they're yeah. now com- competitive games. A um, lot of blowouts between MPL teams and QPL. Now, my take on this was that QPL teams, by and large, apart from probably one this year, know that they're not going to win that competition. That they're, they're just they're not going to get through five group games, quarterfinal, semi-final, they're not going to win it. So they almost look at it as let's get minutes and legs, they change the teams up, because they don't want to go full strength and get battered and have confidence affected. MPL teams, by and large, think they've got a chance to win something here. So they go full strength, they get themselves ready for those three games. Your blowouts come because it's so mismatched. Now I thought, look, if you could um, close the groups down from six to four, and have more chance for a QPL team to get one result and spruik through, you might not get the disparity that you've got at the moment. So six groups of four rather than four or six. Play them during the season because MPL teams will be looking at who they've got on the weekend rather than pre-season where we've got a full week off. They're looking at Wednesday, Saturday. They'll even more out. QPL teams might go, you know what? Fancy ourselves this week. They're going to leave two or three out. They've got Lions this week. 
I just think you might get far more competitive games um, moving forward. Oh, it's an interesting um, point of view, and like obviously happy to happy to take on board any and all feedback about. Uh, about the design and the construction of that competition. I mean, we modified it slightly this year. Yeah. Um, to um, quarterfinals. Yeah, yeah. To 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 get more games. I mean, the the intent behind that particular competition was to do a couple of things. One to formalise in a way the preseason environment. Yeah. And bring some structure to it, and at the same time. Uh, extend the number of match minutes played and the number of fixtures played during the course of a regular season. For NPL, that has to get up to around 30 fixtures. For us to, um, for a number of different reasons, but relating to um, uh, sort of technical outcomes specifically related to the NPL, we need to get match minutes to a certain level. We need to get a number of fixtures played to a certain level. Um, and that's across a number of different, different age groups. So it's critical that those two outcomes are delivered. Yeah. Now, how we do that? Um, well, that's obviously something that we're we're still formulating the best way of doing it. So, year one, it was a certain way. Yeah. We modified it a little bit for, for year two, but ultimately, the guide is match minutes and fixtures. So, um, the fact that it formalises a preseason is a bit of an added bonus, but that's something that we would we would need to keep in some form. But. Yeah. If, if you guys have got a, a, a competition redesign idea, happy to happy to take it on board if it meets those if it meets those objectives. I think maybe yeah. too because it is early stages as well of the um, the competition. We might see later down the track, years to come, sort of thing like whether the F, FA Cup or whatever in the European competitions. Like the the NPL clubs might start to use it as an opportunity to play their younger players and then we might see some more upsets or closer games as well over the longevity. I, the, I think it's gone the other way. You reckon it is? Yeah, because last year uh, I would speak regularly to players and coaches from different clubs and when the, the cover product, they were like, like oh, what a waste of time this is. Yeah. We actually thought, let's try and win it. Yeah, and it comes of course, Knights took it seriously. They won it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this year you, you're finding teams... I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with that in terms of like MP, like well, any cup competition, you should want to win it. In yeah. my opinion, like if you're there to play football for the right reasons, you want to win. Yeah. Um, I think it's on the clubs. You're going to still get blowouts, but you, you know, get blowouts in the NPL round one in the NPL. We've got a blowout with Gold Coast Knights mm, yeah. and Wynnum Wolves. I mean, yes, the correct. thing is, is clubs have missteps, coaches have missteps. Um, it doesn't matter what competitions. Um, so I think at the end of the day, um. It's a great opportunity as well for a little bit of crossover between those two leagues yeah. so that clubs within the, the QPL1 environment can start to better understand what, what is it actually going to take for us to progress into the NPL? What change? What's the what's the standard? How do the clubs operate? How do the coaches operate? Yeah. There's an element of learnings for them as well, and it gives them a great opportunity to play regular football against a, a league above. So there's there's some, some really positive aspects of it. Um, and there's also plenty of games where there aren't where the blowouts yeah, aren't there. Yeah. So it's you know there's 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 a weighing up of what are the benefits, what are the negatives. Well, basically, you're saying that it's here to stay because those competition games have to get up. So yeah. we would obviously it's team so, an issue. So I would yeah. Benny. The, the the alternative is, and it's we're not we're not doing this by the way. Um, we've got to get thirty fixtures, thirty games, roughly, at the NPL level. And you can do that by a number of different ways. You can obviously increase the number of teams yeah. in the NPL, or you can do what we do with the cup competition mm -hmm. running contemporaneously with it. Yeah. Um, we're not changing the number of teams in the NPL because 12 is the right number. I don't think they've, we don't based have the talent. On quality for standard and talent volumes, because if you ratchet that out to 16 to get to 30, you're adding another four clubs, which I, then I you get blowouts in the yeah. league every, then, every then week. Then yeah. you get the same thing. Don't the product. You want so a good product. The product devalues, and and we don't get the technical outcomes that we want out of the NPL. So it's not changing from twelve. That's staying. That's fixed. The whole pyramid staying at twelve. That's not changing. That's fixed. So the alternative is it's not an alternative. It's, it was part of the strategy of going to twelve was to add additional cup competitions. So we're getting the match minutes. We're getting the fixtures. We're doing it without sacrificing the quality and the standard of the NPL. We've created another product. So the the, um, the, the, comp the new competition itself, the 
Pro Series is, a, is an additional product which can be um, expanded and commercialized. Again, all adding value to, to that premier competition environment. So there are, there are reasons why we do it, but can it be enhanced? Of course, like, mm. but that's, that's some learnings. We're only in year yeah. two. Yeah. We're also bumping up the games for QPL on props. Which which also helps. That is that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, and, so, and games against good opposition. From a way. coaching point of view too, Benny. Like if you've got a, a big squad, give yeah, you opportunities. Look, it, it to, certainly does help. Um, but I just think that there's a better way. Yeah, which, to, to get it more competitive. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the cup. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of more games, um, last year the uh, the top four became a top six with a data goal and uh, created more games. Um, <laughs> obviously, the, the situation around the whole, uh, the reasoning for it, I think, is well documented. Um, that one particular club thought that they might miss out and there was maybe a, a threat that they'd take it further if they missed out by a point or two. Um, at what point was the decision made to go to a six? Was it literally the day before? Or had the plan been made a few weeks out that we might have to go down this this route? Um, well, the, the 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 actual process itself um, was ongoing for months. Started so, June, beginning yeah, of June. That's right. So it was uh, you know June, July, August, all the way through to yeah. September. So we're talking three or four months of of a process. It wasn't something that happened overnight where nothing happened and then just before yeah. the final. So it, it it didn't occur like that. So. There, there was a set of circumstances um, through no fault of, of either club involved in those circumstances. Um, and the way a decision was made, either one way or the other, um, put an advantage in favour or a disadvantage in favour of one club or another. And if you reversed it, the disadvantage was reversed. So there was no positive way of resolution yeah. where either club um, didn't have a valid grievance. So despite best efforts to work with both clubs and come up with an environment where a resolution could be achieved over those few months, the, the most logical solution that didn't impact anyone, no fixtures were reversed, no results were reversed, no one got changed in their order in the, in the, uh, in the tables, um, but ultimately opportunity was given for all to participate in the finals through a top six, it was a neat solution that gave a practical, pragmatic resolution to an unsolvable problem. And it's as simple as that. That took some time to work through, um, but at the end of the day, a few weeks out of the final series, again, the decision was made. It didn't impact the order of clubs within that final, in that, within that series, within that top six. Um, uh, but ultimately, neither club um, was negatively or adversely impacted. Well, we were positively impacted because we wouldn't have been in the finals yeah. and we got in. But you weren't but negatively you, impacted. No. Yeah. But, and you you had to make a call before that last day of the season, just That's in right. case. That's right. Yeah. All right. Um, following on from that then, um, and this is more lighthearted, you don't worry <laughs> about this one. Um, when when obviously the, the, the top six has happened and and the finals have begun. Um, deep down, you you got to have been secretly hoping. I hope none of these two get in the final. Like if teams <laughs> from if teams five and six had have made the final and even won it. Yeah, but I think at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how the finals are constructed, whether it's top four or top six. You've got to win the games to get to the finals. If you didn't win the games, then you shouldn't be in the finals. Yeah. So, um, and if you did win the games, then you've got every valid reason to be there. So, it's. Yeah, it's it's an interesting perspective. I think that that only a coach would have. <laughs> yeah. Um, that uh, you know that uh, oh, we had to win more one more game. We had to win one less game. W whatever the environment is, um, at the end of the day, to get to the finals, you have to win the games. Whether you got four, six, eight, or whatever magical number is there, um, but it was a it was a temporary solution that was in place for last year only. Yeah, and. Um, we, as a governing body, we can't make decisions that are based on 
if we do this or don't do this, what is the negative sentiment that comes yep. from it? It is we have to make, we could have sat there and done nothing and just waited to see what happened. The reality is he goes, no, that is the wrong decision. The right decision is that neither club is ne- negatively impacted. Football will be played. That is the right decision. And wh- whether that's negative to some, then that's for us it was irrelevant. Yeah. And look, I think we can all agree that the fact that the top two teams made the grand final mm-hmm. is probably the best outcome for yeah. everybody. Yeah. yeah. And at the same time, everyone had a chance to earn their right on the field, but it that's played right. out that yeah. way anyway. So but sporting cool. merit needs to be the deciding factor, not um uh you know, not that particular set yeah. of circumstances. That should not have been the deciding factor. I guess going on for the top, segue. The, the top six, we'll talk about the uh, the grand final series for um QPL, well, women and men, um, and MPL as well at Suncorp Stadium. Um, on a little bit of negative, I think, feedback in terms of why at Suncorp Stadium. It's awesome for the players, don't get me wrong, um, but there was a little bit of grumblings around kickoff times, teams not being able to celebrate afterwards because of the turnaround of games, um, food, viewer, I guess, experience because it's such a big stadium. Um, what what was the what was the thought process behind the decision? Um, and obviously, it's going back there again this year, so it was obviously successful enough. Um, and just basically, I guess, getting out anything that the general public wouldn't know about the decision, because on the surface, sometimes it looks like Suncorp Stadium can't come cheap, and could that money be better spent elsewhere? I guess. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting point. I think um, uh, from from our perspective. Uh, our intent behind going to Suncorp Stadium was was multifaceted, um, but ultimately driven by our, our desire to improve the quality and the standard of the product. Yeah. So MPL and QPL, the environment that they play their finals in, uh, we need to lift that product to a level that we think commensurate with the league. So we can keep playing at you know substandard stadiums that are you know, have some, you know, romantic element to them, but ultimately the overall quality of that product, we're always going to be, you know, hidden in the doldrums of um, of the sporting world or we can elevate the status to where we think it should be. And that is at the Premier Stadium uh, in Queensland. So, so primarily it was lift the standard, lift the product, lift the experience, um, put the players in an environment that's, that's unique and start to build a spectator experience over time. So th- that decision was made um, uh, to take that step. And ultimately we had, you know, over 6,000 people come through the gates, yeah. which for us, we were we thought 5,000 would be a success. So we had 6,000. So we, we exceeded our expectations. Um, it was on a Sunday because um, the Saturday was, was ruled out because the agreement that the stadium has with um, the Broncos and Rugby League. Um, they have certain Friday and Saturday um, contracted in September to account for any possibility that the Broncos will be in the semifinals and then right. potentially the final, not the finals, but on their road to the finals. So there's certain weekends that are, are booked out all the time. So because of our competition window, it had to happen on that weekend. So the only week, the only time slot available was the Sunday. So that's changed this year where we, we switched with the Broncos. They've, get, they've got the week after, the Friday, Saturday, and we've got the week before, So which gave us the opportunity to do it on the Saturday. So that will be um, an improved experience. Last year was obviously year one. So fitting four fixtures in um, is a monstrous effort and the timing of that needs to happen perfectly. A lot of things right, but also a lot of learnings, um, which we've solved a lot of those for for this year. So, um, how we're going to have the the, cel- the post game celebrations, um, we've we've resolved that. We've come to a position which we think will be um, supported by clubs, whoever's in it, um, and we're also working on a few other user experiences that would um, uh, that will come into play on the day. So. A lot of learnings. It was year one, so to put on an event like that um, was, you know, you, 
you're going to get some things right, you're going to get some things wrong. But ultimately, it's we need to invest in something that we can build over time for the benefit of the game. And the people that were there, I think, had a fantastic experience. The, the, the atmosphere was was excellent. Yep. Um, and uh, the numbers of people that showed up was, for us, year one was quite good. So we, we would encourage all participants in Queensland football to come to the grand final day, experiences it as a, as a football product. Um, watching it on streaming, you know, whilst that's perfectly fine, you're not going to get the same experiences going to a game. No. And Is there any cap on the amount of people you're allowed to get through the gate? Are you saying no, everyone no. come along? And no, not cap? specifically, no. So we, we ultimately secured the lower half of the Western stand, which you can fit 10,000 people in. So that was, um, that was what we... Um, it allows us to come up with a way or a solution of making it economical. So we're not hiring the whole stadium. You're not having to fill out the whole stadium. You know, it's security not staffing. Yeah, it's not, not staffing, not putting security out for the whole stadium. It's we, we got carefully selected one block, lower side of the Western stand. Um, we got some corporate as well, but ultimately it made it affordable. Yeah. So and you, so the costs were covered. Yeah, sorry, go. The, well, that's, that's something that I automatically in my head thought, well, oh, that's got to be expensive. But I don't, I don't know that. Like you yeah. don't, you don't. Do you think there's a benefit of putting? Not that I think it, you have to justify every. It's not saying that you have to justify every single. But do you think yeah. maybe putting some of that information public might, you know, soften the appease, yeah, appease yeah. the the mob as you. Yeah, but it, appease who though? Like same well, question. We go back to the start of the conversation. Is who, um, any reasonable person right who who loves football goes grand final day men's and women's games, pinnacle of the year, let's go to Suncorp yeah. and have a family day or let's go for a day with the girls or the boys or whoever it is. You don't go, how much does this cost? Why are they having it here? Why yeah. aren't we doing it at another park? Like I think the, the naysayers are the, um, uh, uh, we're not doing it for them because we could have um, uh, the Matildas play there at the same time in a warm-up game and they'll still complain. And I, I don't think that there's... Um, we need to focus on uh, improving the product that we have and and do it for the broader audience that we're trying to build something for. Yeah, and I get that. Yeah. So I, do, look, I do understand that point. I just think like, I don't know, like it, I think who, who would probably be football, I've got two young boys now that I'm now having to pay registrations for and it's not cheap. So I think some people's minds might go, well, there's a lot of money going into registrations. There's a lot of obviously a lot of yeah. that money has to go to the federation. I would assume. So I think that's where maybe the gripes coming from, where people go, "Well, God, they must have en- enough money to sort of." Yeah. Okay. It's, no, it's it's a it's a valid point that you raise, and ultimately, the 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 event itself um, didn't cost Football yes. Queensland anything. Okay. So there was no impact on. Registration fees at all, members. and no, not at all. Yeah. So, um, in terms of overall registration fees and and the the proportionality of registration fees on our revenue, three or four years, what, 24, 20, 20, 20, yeah, so four years ago, registration fee income represent represented over forty five percent of Football Queensland's revenue. Now it's in the twenties. Yeah. So. Our registration fees have been static or gone down over the last four years, and its representation of our income has dropped significantly. So we're trying to work towards an environment where we're not reliant on registration yeah, fees perfect. because as the, uh, the inflationary cost environment that we operate in, it's easy for member federations across Australia, and all of them do. Mm. They did it last year. They do it every year except Queensland just put up fees to raise revenue. We haven't done that and it's not our intention to do that. So our reliance on registration fees as a proportion of our our, our revenue has dropped significantly because we've diversified how we generate our income, dramatically increased commercial opportunities, um, which has completely shifted how um, we fund the game. Yeah. There's probably, you, know, you talk about there's the educated lot, there's the mob. I think there's probably a group in between that as well. Um, it's the biggest group. 
Yeah, and and as as you're saying, Tom, it's it's a case of there's a lot of people in that group who probably have those same questions, but they don't know enough to know yeah. that kind of thing. So maybe I guess leading on from your point of would it help to put some of that information out publicly to appease that group as more so than you know the mob? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I, um, I take on board what you're saying. How do how do you how do you tell as with the the, the thousand things that we do each week? How do you tell um, the things that require, you know, like how do you know that someone wants to know how you're doing well, delivering the finals? How do you yeah, know that that's correct. it's but important? I think that's why I think this episode could be very important because a lot of these questions that we know that have been brought up through the football community are now getting answered. Mm. You know, so you don't have to divulge all your information. Yeah. But those, for me, like I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. When I saw it first off, I was critical of it just because I thought, fine, well, who's paying for this? Yeah. But that's just me, as in like I'm paying registration. Yeah, you were thinking now. I'm paying for this. <laughs> but from a player's point of view, or like a club's point of view, I couldn't think like it would be unreal to be a part of. Like yeah. I would, I would have, I would have loved for it to be a part like you know five, six, seven years ago or whatever like that yeah. when you're actually playing for finals. If you know you're gonna play at Suncorp Stadium, maybe. You, you take that final series yeah. a little bit more because my opinion, if you finish first, that's yeah, it. So finish I think first, that, the finals don't matter. Yeah, but now I'm like... Oh, well, that's a, a whole player, other argument. Yeah, no, I, think, right. I, I think there's a merit for both. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those guys that says, oh, well, get rid of the finals. Shut up. Yeah. Anyway, I, if I was in that position four or five years ago when you're in the semifinals and you have an opportunity to play at Suncorp, I'm thinking, let's get Suncorp. That's you, just you, what I'm you're thinking. You're devastated if you go out in round one. Yeah, because you missed our opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Correct. But also, we needed to show though, like, if, we, if we're going to improve the the standard, the relevance, and the profile of football, yeah. if we're arguing for better infrastructure outcomes, Correct. if we're arguing yeah. for better stadium outcomes that, that, that are more relevant for football, how do you do that if you're not actually yeah. doing what we're doing? If we get you, a good turnout for our national yeah. final series, then we can you can go to the government and go, look, this is what football's doing. Like we need yeah. our own boutique stadiums, right. and which are Pretty good segue. Oh, a great segue. How about no, we, these we, we, we mentioned um, subpar stadiums um, and the the romance that goes with some of the local clubs and grounds. A lot of the buzz on social media, again, talk about social media, um, sick of saying those words. <laughs> but a lot of the talk is about Perry Park is the home. It's the spiritual home of football in, in Queensland, or in Brisbane. Is Perry Park the answer? Uh, look, uh, you know, there's... there's um, it, it depends on what the question is, like, you know, whether it's the answer. Um, the, the question should be is, is does football require a more appropriate stadium that reflects its needs? 100% it does. Absolutely. Absolutely. The game, we have enough content to sustain it. Um, we have enough opportunity that's not future opportunity. It's actually existing opportunity to sustain it. The, the city... And the state needs a football appropriate stadium that reflects um, football's very unique requirements. And the uh, the fact that we don't have one is symptomatic of, of 20 or 30 years of failure as a code to actively advocate for our needs. Now that's obviously changing dramatically and very quickly. Um, is our preference for that to be a Perry Park? Of course it is, for a number of, um, you know, romantic reasons. Mm-hmm. But that could be a, it. Could be a Victoria Park. But I was going to say, rephrase the question: um, Is it a redeveloped Perry Park that should be the home moving forward, or do we start fresh with something brand new? Or try um, to look. The the Perry Park's obviously got a lot of um, very suitable elements to it. It's it's in the inner city, which is perfect. It's on a train line, which is even better. Uh, it's on major road infrastructure, even better. So you can access it from pretty much anywhere yep. and very quickly. And it links in with a broader, you know, sporting spine on those train lines. So you can get from there to Suncorp, to the Gabba, to Brisbane Live, uh, Roma Street. You can get to all of those things from yep. Perry Park, or you can get to Perry Park from all of those places. So it is in the right place. Um, having an opportunity in the inner city um, helps bring to life um, those urban areas in other ways, like, you know, going to the valley and then going to watch a football game or going to watch a football well, game. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I probably got that backwards, yeah. but, you know. I'm, Depends I'm, if you're playing or not. Yeah. yeah. Valley. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, my game. Valley. Yeah. 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 So, so um, in that Uber. 
there's uh, and it's there is an opportunity to fit the right sized stadium there. Yeah. Um, so th- th- there's no question. It's been it's been on our top three infrastructure priorities for for four years now, and um, we're absolutely um, working, putting in significant work to 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 eventually bring that to life. So um, it's important for the code, and it's important for not only this professional and semi-professional levels, it's important for women's sport, women's football, um, but also the A-League expansion as well. Yeah. We should have a second Brisbane team. It will absolutely mobilise a, a broader fan base. It's something that can only be brought into life if we have appropriate infrastructure. Yeah. And whilst we're based at Suncorp Stadium, it's unlikely to happen. Yeah. So same with the national second team. It's unlikely to happen because we just simply don't have the right infrastructure. Mm. Fair enough. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Well, you, I you, think it's you can yeah. follow, hit, hit, me, hit me with another well, one. So what just do you to follow ask? up, so um, you see you're working, you know, behind the scenes, etc. Are you working behind the scenes to um, to to look at redeveloping Perry Park, or working behind the scenes to get a new location and start fresh? Um, well, the, the answer is both. So yeah. just whatever works out to be the best option. Is um, the one look, there's, there's, there's both solutions in play, but ultimately the preferred option is Perry Park for a number of reasons yeah. because the, location, the, the, the location works well for a, for a stadium of that particular size. But like anything, you, you, you don't want to be exclusive of any other options because if someone says no to Perry Park for whatever reason, and you've chopped all your eggs in one you don't, you don't have any other yeah. alternatives. It's not it's not really the smartest thing. I'd like to see it to be Perry Park because, you know, the old 4X League days, like my old man talks about going to, like all the grand finals being held there in yeah. the early 80s and whatnot. And Pre-Brisbane Strikers, when it used to be the home of football Queensland, not so much just everyone associates Perry Park now with Strikers. No, but it was the home of football Queensland. It yes, correct. From the 60s. Yeah, so but yeah. that's what I'm saying, like pre Sorry, yeah, pre strikers days, it was it was the place everyone went. Yeah. All the finals, all the big games were played there. I think we need that. We do hundred yeah. percent need that. So cup games, big cup games, big, the competition, the Kappa Cup needs it needs a home. It needs yeah. somewhere where the younger generation growing up can aspire to play like it's not Suncorp. Yeah. They're not playing Suncorp, they want to aspire to play at Perry Park, which is 100%. the home of football. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to see it come back to Perry Park, but obviously There'd be a lot of Look, uh, and and that is that is absolutely the ambition. But in order to get there, it's not always a linear no, process. Yeah. And to create a particular argument with key stakeholders, you have to prove particular points. And yeah. and that is you guys kicking it's each other under the sorry, table. Mate. Dusty's just booting oh, the uh, I think I'm cramping up. <laughs> oh, sorry, mate, you haven't played six minutes. So, again. Yeah, so it's it's um look the the, the this process is not linear, yeah. but it's something that look, yeah, we're we're football people. Yeah. I was one of those kids who used to go to Perry Park in, yeah. the, in the in the 70s and 80s watching those games. So I 100% know what you're talking about. So because it's a, it's lived experience, yeah. and um, it'd be absolutely a, a, a dream come true from our perspective to reunite this particular organisation with its with its original roots, yeah. and that is to be able to deliver a, a home of football um, where. You know, it, you know, it's it's been historically an institution of the game. So, um, but we have to do it very, very carefully. And we have yeah. to do it very smartly, and um, and uh, and again, we, we do it in a way which is not necessarily you know reflected on social media. No. Nah. Cool. All nice. right. Um, I'm gonna finish with two quick ones. Yeah, sure. We've covered quite a lot. Um, two real quick ones. Um, we we spoke about this off air. Um, down the track, uh, a potential loan system in the local game. Uh, and I'll give you the example that we gave before. If you've, if a club has had a young kid come through from even six, seven, eight year old, and they get to 18 year old, good player, not quite first team ready, but you would think that by sending them out to a, a club in the, the division below, maybe they'd come back, they'd be a little bit wiser, more experienced, stronger for it but we have to pay points in a PPS system. So you don't do it and you, selfishly you retain the player instead of developing them. Um, a, a loan system whereby those points could be 
moved to one side. Is there any hope for that in the future? Look, I think the answer is, um, you know, whilst Football Australia will ultimately govern yeah. the delivery of any such system, um, that would be absolutely part of the ambitions of uh, of our ecosystem as it matures. Obviously, we've we've come into um, a, an environment in the last sort of twelve months with um, some of the transfer systems, yeah. the early early phases of the transfer systems. A lot of that will evolve over time, as will borrowing of players and how that works. So there is um, there's always ambitions in the short to medium term to continually to progress our game's regulatory environment yeah. so that it reflects a more mature environment. And that means having the ability to loan players and do those sort of things. So I can't give you an exact answer as to um, when and how that will yeah. happen, but they're always part of conversations that we have with Football Australia about about our system and there are many elements of um, being careful with my words there are many elements of that system which are currently under review and um, potentially modified in in 2025 cool all right good and and finally um i'm just throwing this one out i haven't even told you about uh, magic round possibility for a magic round <laughs> um in in the future uh, like, give me an example. Like, uh, there's, there's probably there's, there's few different views on magic rounds. Well, so. One weekend, um, one venue, or two venues if you want. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the games mm -hmm. in the MPL. Definitely possible. We did think about it during COVID, um, and uh, don't think we ended up doing it. But um, probably the worst time to do it, getting everyone together. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it was spread out. Everyone put your mask on. Yeah. yeah, it was. I think it was at a time when, um, uh, well, it was, it was a crazy time back then. We were trying to come up with different solutions to keep football going. But um, look, I don't, I don't see any reason why it couldn't happen. But we'd just have to get agreement from clubs. Um, well, the, the home clubs would have. Yeah, issue. That, they're yeah. going to miss that one a day. That's I right. So home home clubs would give away a home game, and um, look, most codes do it. Yeah, in one form or another. Um, and they do it successfully because you can try and create a product, people come and watch it, yeah. and obviously there's ways of compensating clubs for that loss. So mm -hmm. if, if clubs uh, have a position that's something that, that, that they're happy to consider, then, you know, there's no reason why they would. Cool. So I'm not, not against it. So. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, look, Rob, really want to thank you for um, being our first guest of yeah, this understand. particular series. Um, been really informative. Hopefully, you know the, the viewers will find the same that we found. It's um, a lot of questions that have been answered that you know you wouldn't normally otherwise get. Otherwise, wouldn't have. Correct. And uh, yeah, uh, wish you well. Obviously no worries. With, thank you. With the role, I know it's difficult. Yeah. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed. It's a it's a good season for everyone. Likewise. Participation continues to grow. And uh, yeah, likewise. Thanks best again. best of luck with the series and. I'll uh, enjoy watching the rest of them. You'll be the one us if you do. It'll be all good. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, we'll be back uh, in two weeks' time. It's a fortnightly uh, video season. So we'll be back in two weeks' time with another guest. Um, but like, share, subscribe, do what you got to do. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>